We have a few things to get in today that are maybe not on our regular schedule. And uh, so, if we, but I'm going to, you know, all those folks that are out there are still coming in, it's on them. So if we go a little bit long, we can, we can talk about that. But that's good. You're visiting, you're sharing with each other. Um, uh, Carrie, did you want to do that now? Let's do it now. Okay. And is there uh, someone, from, I'm looking for witness. You want, do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? We're just going to thank everybody. Okay, okay. Carrie will go first. I just want to say thank you to everybody who donated items for the yard sale and worked at the yard sale. Some of you worked like dogs. And I'm so grateful. And we raised over $2,800. So... I think that's a loaves and fishes thing. Like we had a few things that were 25 cents and it turned into $2,800. So thank you. And we had heard so much from the community of thank you and stories and they missed us last year. So thank you. Uh, we need to give Carrie a hand and Matt and the witness commission. So just, to, I want to, okay, so... When you're on the witness commission, your spouse gets drug into it whether they want to or not um, because uh, and Dean uh, Van Gorp and, uh, and Leroy Heckethorne, well, Barb was here and Carrie was here and Kendra was here and so we are so blessed to have that, uh, that, that, that edifying partnership. But I want to ex expressly thank the, the witness commission and the, the support that they got from their families. And then, like Carrie says, all the people that work with the yard sale, all the folks that brought out tractors and cars and, and everything. It was never our goal to raise money for this. Even back years ago, whenever we started doing this, it was meant to be an outreach to the community, to share grace and love, to get to know people a little better and have a little something that... Sometimes it's hard for people to come to church because, it, oh, it's church. You know, but hey, when there's, a, there's an old tractor and some guys standing around or there's a nice car and some people are doing it, or if there's lots of wonderful gifts and yard sale items to look at, that's an open door and it lets us share God's love and it lets us uh, be that. And so beyond what was raised as, that, as a real fringe benefit on that, there was much grace and love shared uh, yesterday. So, and to just let you know, we were putting our last piece of furniture to be picked up away in the shed out here. And then God said, it is time for you to go home. <laughs> and ripped open the skies and the, it all came down and there was hail and there was wind. And it said, and so we're like, we paid attention. So we, we, God was blessed. It was a blessing there as well. So again, I want to extend that, uh, that, that gratitude from the church to everyone that helped um, there was some remarkable stuff. Uh, is Melody here? That girl right there carried the yard sale. So um, that uh, it's just a blessing. So thank you for every uh, everybody's participation and support in many ways. So yes. Oh, they're, yeah, they're curious. Yeah, Glenn, Glenda and Lynn were the people that were working the table at the yard sale. And there you go. So, <laughs> I, so I'm very gratified. I think that, that uh, we, we were able to show God's love yesterday, and, and we're grateful for that opportunity. I think that's all my announcements. There may be another announcement did, did Sherry talk to you, Pat? You got it all worked out? Okay. Kind of. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How cute. Um, as part of the ministry commission, we like, you know, we take the opportunity to uh, thank people and recognize our special members. Well, we're all special, but someone that's especially special to us on their birthday, which would be Tasha, has, I know. 
And Tasha, what I'll tell you is if there's anyone that hates coming up here in front of the people more than you, <laughs> it's me. <laughs> but so I'm going to make you join me. And it'll be real quick. But... I was going to get off because it wasn't on a Sunday. <laughs> yes. I thought it would just slip under the radar. No, no. So anyway, Tasha yeah. has a birthday this week. Thank you. There's two gifts in here. Okay. One you will recognize, I think, from your church family. Okay. The other was a recommendation, I'm going to throw him under the bus, from your husband. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And when you, when you open them, I'm hoping you can tell the difference. Okay. <laughs> and and oh, we may see one of them back at the yard sale next year. No. <laughs> <laughs> We may. <laughs> no, you won't. You won't. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everybody. You are all such a blessing. And uh, like I always say, we're all in this together. But I thank you for your kind thoughts. And thank you, Carrie, and everyone who helped yesterday. I just have to say it again. And uh, let's press on. Showing and sharing God's love. All right? Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Well, everything I was going to say, good job. <laughs> yeah. No, that was just absolutely wonderful. And, um, yeah, it was great. And the huge trailer load and stuff of stuff didn't go. It was just dusty stuff that I just took out. And Mother Nature said, let me clean this for you. So <laughs> we have very wet couches and chairs, but they're clean. <laughs> so Youth Ranch, I'm sure, is going to be very pleased with our donation. <laughs> But again, amen. It takes a family, and you saw it. It was really good. Okay, let me open with a prayer, and then I'll read the scripture. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for showing us the paths that lead to life. We are so grateful that we can experience joy in your presence forever. Help us to live in a manner that is worthy of the calling in which you have called us by spending time in your word. We never want to forget having access to the scripture is a true gift. So please make us eager to read your words. Reveal your will to us as we spend time in your presence. Teach us your word, which is truth, and your calling, which is true joy. In Jesus' name. Amen. And today's scripture is Psalms 100. And I, I love this because I had to learn this in junior high. And then as a camp counselor at Victory Cove for the Nazarenes, I had to teach it. Had to teach it. And it, of course, because I knew it, of course I was going to teach it. <laughs> and then it never goes away. Now when I see it, I had to read the first line. I got this. So, I'll try, not to, <laughs> I'll try not to ad lib too much. <laughs> Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, and we are his. We are his pe people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and love endures forever. His faithfulness, faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen. May you be blessed by the reading of the word. When I was looking for songs of joy, I found a song. Oh, it's got great words. I don't know the song. So I, I played it all week. Trying, okay, I can handle this. Marta's going to be okay. She'll lead me along. So I asked her this morning, do you know this song? No. <laughs> so we're going to sing it like we think it might, might go. And if any of you know it, and you know better than what we're doing, Sing out loud so we can hear you. 
It's actually in your blue hymnal, um, the supplement, page 1016 in the supplement. She's playing it right now. Does that sound familiar? kids to come. What do I got? You want to come up, Grayson? In autumn? In summer? Come on up. Oh, you're looking around. Good morning. So, now, I need you guys to be honest with me. Can you do that? Tell me the truth. Do you guys ever get into trouble? She looked right at you. <laughs> Do you ever get into trouble? And if you're having trouble, maybe owning up to that, I have to tell you, I get in trouble. I get in trouble now, and I got into trouble when I was a kid, too, like your age. Can you believe that? I didn't always do the right thing. Well, let me tell you something. When you do something wrong and then you maybe see your dad coming or your mom coming, what do you feel in your heart? Do you feel like, yay, they're coming to see what I did wrong? Or do you feel like, oh no, they're coming to see what I did wrong? Which one do you think? The second one? Maybe a little bit. I know there were many times, and my dad probably could tell you a whole lot of stories, when I saw him coming, I was not happy. Because I was in trouble. But let me tell you something about God. Even though God knows everything about us, everything that we do, God knows. God loves us even though that's the way it is. Even when there, we talked about Romans today, and we didn't get to this part of the, of the book of Romans where it says that, that even when we were still doing things wrong, even when we were still sinners, God loved us so much to give his son for us. That's a pretty cool thing to think about. So whenever we're, whenever we're aware that God is with us, which he is all the time, we can be comfortable. We don't have to be afraid because of God's great love. So here's what I want you guys to remember. Even when we do things wrong, even when we make mistakes, God still loves us. God's love is never going to go away. All right? And sometimes when we feel a little bit like, oh, maybe nobody loves us that much, trust that God does, okay? 
That's for you all too. All right. Shall we pray together? Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for your great love. It's so big. And we don't even understand how big it is. And sometimes we feel like maybe you won't love us if we do things that we shouldn't do. But we know that your love is bigger than all the things that we might possibly make mistakes on. We just pray that you would continue to help us understand more of your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, she got away. All right, you guys can go down. All of us, isn't it? It's easy to, especially after all this lockdown and separation and all this negativity in the world, it's good to remember God loves us. And that's the important part. We're going to stand and sing, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. And you have to get to where you can do a little bounce and, and boopy doop with it. <laughs>
Yes, we did. And we'll part try that again now that you know it. Have a seat. Thank you. Joy unspeakable. I want to invite you, if you would, to, if you'd like to, turn to Colossians chapter 3 for our scripture this morning. I had such a good time going through Colossians those few months ago when we were kind of preaching through that letter. It, every time I go back to it, I'm like, oh, familiar ground. This is the third chapter, the twelfth verse. We'll begin our reading today. I'm going to read through the seventeenth verse. Paul writes to the church there, As God's chosen ones, holy and and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In his essay, The Lantern Bearers, Robert Louis Stevenson describes the task of the poet to find out where joy resides and to give it a voice far beyond singing, for to miss the joy is to miss all. We've been talking about joy now for a few weeks and kind of exploring this idea of Christian joy, how central joy is to the life of the Christian. Stevenson, he's talking about the work of the poet, but I'd suggest that it is the Christian's calling to give joy a voice beyond all singing. But like everyone, we may all be in danger at times of missing joy And if Stevenson's right, then in missing joy, we may miss all. The question I'd like to approach today is this. What is our response to joy? We've been talking about the way that God gives us joy, the way that God makes it possible for us to have joy, and it's all coming from God. But what is our response going to be? If it's so core to the Christian experience, if we might miss all, if we miss joy, then how do we bring joy into our heart's home and live in that joy? A caveat before we begin, a disclaimer. I want to be clear about something. I don't want us to view joy as if it were some sort of an acquisition, uh, as if we might go down to the joy store and pick up a carton of joy and bring it home so that we've got it for the week. It's not the way we're, we should be thinking about this. Joy, in fact, is stubbornly resistant to any efforts that we put into trying to control it or get more of it or have it as our own. I think this is probably partially due, at least, to the way joy is uh, connected to happiness in our minds. Happiness, well, happiness is inevitably rooted in chance. There's no mistake that the word origin of happiness and happenstance is the same. Randomness. That's our life so often. Sometimes it makes us happy, sometimes not. And when we are mired in this idea that everything that happens around us needs to be favorable, it has to be good in order for us to be happy or joyful, if it's about joy because of, then we might be tempted to try to game the system a little bit and tweak things to our, to our favor. We might try to put our thumb on the scales of chance and press down and try to make things work out a little bit more the way we would like them. We, we seek out those circumstances that in the past have proven to be favorable and enjoyable. We go to those places that made us happy. But here's the thing that, I, that needs to be clear. Joy 
is something that comes to us from outside of us. It is not something that we can control. We don't grab a hold of it because joy does not originate with us. It happens beyond us, in spite of us at times. There is a certain emotional response to things, uh, circumstances, a feeling that we associate with joy, but that feeling comes when our eyes are opened to the gift that comes from outside of circumstances from the one that loves us. So let's set this idea aside, that this is going to be a, a message about how you can get more joy in your life. I do want us to feel joy, to miss it, maybe to miss all, but this is not a self-help message. This is not me telling you, hey, do these 12 things and you're going to be great. It's not that kind of message. It's more of a self-awareness message, to know yourself a little better. And, and beyond knowing ourselves, it's an encouragement to know what is beyond us and witness the true origin of joy. Mary Clark Moschella, she's a professor of pastoral care and counseling at Yale Divinity School, and she writes, the noun joy has been defined as the emotion of great delight, of happiness, caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Keen pleasure. Elation. I think of joy, she goes on, as an embodied awareness of holy presence and extravagant love. I really like that definition. I'm going to say it again. An awareness of holy presence and extravagant love. An awareness that dawns Upon us like grace, she writes. It carries a sense of the unexpected, of surprise. Michelle is touching on this truth. True joy comes as a gift. And our sense of joy, our awareness of joy, how tuned in to joy we are, it's dependent upon our awareness of holy presence. What we're talking about is recognizing that God is here. That God is present, that God is with us, and that God loves us. I want you to think about that lost sheep. Remember from Luke 15, that story that we talked about a few weeks ago? If we want to attribute some kind of a human emotion to sheep, and I know that may be a stretch because sheep are what they are, but if we want to kind of think about them in human terms, this sheep that's lost is not doing well it's scared it's alone it's afraid it's caught up maybe in some kind of a bramble down in the down in the bushes in the bottom of a ravine or something and it's 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 not doing well happy thoughts just think happy thoughts that's not going to cut it in this situation there's there's no joy because of circumstances here, because the circumstances for this sheep are not great. But then the sheep looks up and catches sight of the good shepherd coming over the ridge, dropping down to where it is, coming down into that scrub brambles and the thorns and the bushes and where the sheep is caught. And the shepherd takes the branches and pulls them apart and, 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 and pulls them back and he scratches and cuts up his own hands in the process and he frees that sheep. And he takes it up on his shoulders and, and he carries it home. It's too weak to walk on its own. And the, the shepherd brings it back to where, where they're safe. So again, if this sheep could feel human emotions like we feel, what would that sheep be feeling? When it sees the, the shepherd coming up over the rise and dropping down into the ravine where it's trapped, what would it be feeling? When, it, when it's freed from those brambles and those thorns, what would it be feeling when it was carried home? Relief? Yeah, sure. But maybe something deeper. Maybe joy would be a better word to describe it. Joy because the one who saves is near. And salvation is not something that's off in the distance, but it is a present reality. The passages we find in Luke 15, those three parables, they all talk about the joy that is in heaven when something is found, when the sheep, the coin, or the prodigal. But certainly the lost who are found, the prodigal that comes home, also experience that joy themselves. 
But they don't create that joy. That's not something that comes from within. They, they only feel it. They feel it because they have, in that moment, become aware of the holy presence of God and God's extravagant love. That's what it is to have joy. So here's the thing. The writer of the Hebrews tells us, he relates this truth that God will never leave us, that God will never forsake us. And I think the writer of the Hebrews is drawing on the wisdom of the psalmist when the psalmist wrote that God is a refuge and a strength and a a, a well-proved help in time of trouble. Now, if God is a well-proved help who will never leave us and never forsake us, then the issue about awareness, uh, about being aware of God's holy presence, being aware of God's extravagant love, the problem doesn't reside on God's side. He's there. The problem resides with us. We're not aware. And God has been there all along, and we're just missing it somehow. Joy is available. It is present, but we might miss it, and in missing it, we may miss all. So what is it that gets in our way? What is it that clouds our vision, that that keeps us from being aware of joy and aware of God's presence? Again, I want to be clear about something. What I'm talking about joy, I'm not talking about joy as a commodity, as something we acquire. I'm not trying to tell you what you need to do to have joy have joy in that acquisitional sense. What I, what I hope for us today is that, when, is that we will seek God. And that's it. Just seek God. Open your eyes to God and that we would do what we can to become more aware of that holy presence and that extravagant love. And believe me, sisters and brothers, joy will come as a result. You'll get it. You'll feel it as a result. It has to. Because what could possibly be more joyous than being in the presence of the very origin of joy? So let's keep that clear. But at times we do. We feel less than joyful. And it's not because God is not present. There's something else that's a problem. We're unaware of that presence. There's something in the way clouding our vision. Now, We all experience difficulty in life. Situations can seem to get in the way of us feeling joy. Moshella, in her work in pastoral counseling, she's witnessed this and witnessed the depth of pain and grief that comes along with just being a human being. Ray Waddle wrote an article about her and tells this story. Teaching an introductory pastoral care class some years ago, Moshella had covered a roster of important but grim themes. Grief, trauma, Poverty, substance abuse, racism, sexism, classism. When she saw the students were looking scared. The semester was nearly over when I walked into class one day, she says, and noticed their eyes as if they were saying, what is she going to hit us with next? You could think about this in a pastoral care class, how it's just one bad thing after another that you have to figure out how to deal with. Rather than allowing circumstances to banish joy, Moshella says that joy allows one to experience deep sorrow with less fear because the precious and the precarious dimensions of life present themselves as intertwined. It's just part of the fabric that, we are, that is us. You see, God has not abandoned us in that pain. God has not left us in that pain. We, God will not leave us. God will not forsake us. So the, the author and originator of joy is still there and that joy is still possible even in the pain, even in the suffering, perhaps in spite of the difficulty. So more problematic than just that bad things happen to us is our response to those bad things, our response to that circumstance. And I'm talking about a specific one here. I'm going to deal with it in depth. Anger. Too often our response to difficulty is anger. How many of us have done that? How many of us have felt that at some time in our lives? And anger's tricky. And I want to try to unpack it a little bit and and hopefully get some insight here. Indignation, that's one. Indignation, it often leads to anger. 
that seems to be a natural human response. We don't really have a lot to do. It just pops up in our lives when we get indignant about things. How, how many of you have felt indignant over something recently? Come on. Did you, watch, did you read the paper? Did you watch the news? Something's going to make you indignant. How, how, do, do things rub you the wrong way where you're just like, oh, man, I don't like that. That's normal. Jesus himself displayed a certain amount of indignation. There's a great Greek word. I'm going to try to pronounce it. I'll probably butcher it, but I'm going to give it a shot. Embrimalmai. Remember that one. Embrimalmai is, and I'm probably putting the emphasis in the wrong place, but it's usually translated in the scriptures as deeply moved in spirit. That's the way it's translated in John 11:33. Jesus goes to the tomb of his, his good friend Lazarus, and he is deeply moved in spirit when he encounters these mourners there. That's a, that's, a, that's a fair translation, deeply moved in spirit. I'm sure he was feeling that. But a more accurate one is snorting with indignation. You imagine a horse, when the horse snorts, that's, that's what that word means. Jesus is like, Pugh! What's going on here? You can't escape the frustration that comes with that word. And Jesus, in this John passage, he's, he's, he's not deeply moved with grief, although he certainly probably was, but that's not what they're referring to here. He's more likely indignant that these mourners who'd come out from Jerusalem to Bethany would, were, were responding the way that they were. Jesus knew more. And we could unpack all that stuff in a whole other sermon if we wanted to. But just understand this. Indignation is not the problem. Feeling indignant about something, well, Jesus himself was indignant. But indignation, that sense that eh, this isn't right, that moves us forward in a certain direction. And Jesus takes one direction and we often go another route. See, when our indignation with situations that, that frustrate it leads us to anger, then we've opened the door to a lot of pretty bad stuff, really. In Galatians 5, uh, Paul has this wonderful list that you all know, the fruit of the Spirit. It's it, that, that go up a block there and you'll see all the works of the flesh, all the things that you do not want in your life. And Paul includes anger right in there with all that other works of the flesh, the idolatry, the, the enmity, the strife, the jealousy, the fornication, the dissension. Really, it's pretty grim. And anger's right in the middle of it. This is not that, that righteous indignation that we, everybody thinks that they have. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's my righteous indignation. I'm upset with these things. It's not what Paul's talking about here. This is a selfish corruption of that indignation that tries to justify our negative and, and angry and hostile and and rage-filled reactions to things. Yeah, things aren't always what they should be. That's, that's a fact of life. Moshella observes there are a lot of important but very grim themes. But if our response to these situations is rooted in anger, if that's our natural go-to, obviously we're going to miss out on joy. Joy is not going to be present. That anger obscures our awareness of God. How many hours of our lives are wasted just being angry? Oh, well, nobody here, right? Yeah, it's, it's those people out there. But yeah, how many hours, how many days, how many years do we spend being angry and stuck in that anger? How many relationships got wounded because of that corrupted indignation that they're just not doing what I think they ought to be doing? Why does Jesus connect anger with murder <laughs> in Matthew 5.22? Why does Paul warn us away from anger, not only in Galatians 5, but in 2 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 and 1 Timothy 2 over and over again? Why does James say that anger does not produce righteousness in James 1.20? Because anger is a problem. You get the point now? Am I putting too much of a, I'm not making it too fine, am I? Anger is a problem. And here's why I think it's a problem. When we're indignant, natural response, we recognize that a situation is not what it ought to be. Not what it could be or should be. We recognize something is wrong and we don't like it. And you're all right so far. 
Anger, though, that, that bad anger that the Scriptures warn us about, that's, got, that's not a recognition of the problem. That's a reaction to our recognition. We've already gone past just recognizing it. Something has upset us, and then we take those next steps, and we end up in anger. We get mad about it, and we reach that reactionary fork in the road where we could make a choice of going one way or another, where we could learn to uh, turn, turn one way and trust God and trust that God's going to take care of it and that things are going to work out and everything's okay because God's got it. Or we can get mad and we can get angry and we can get rage-filled even if we, if we allow it to go too far that direction. That's, that's a self-centered direction. This is the God-centered direction. We go that self-centered way, we're more often than not headed in a destructive direction. I just want us to recognize that. Just recognize the destructive path, the destructive process. It is one thing to know things are not the way they should be, to recognize that and maybe not like it. It's another one to allow that work of the flesh, that bad thing that Paul wants us to get rid of, to rule in our response. Anger will always cloud your awareness of joy. You want to feel good in life? Stop being angry. Just don't do it. Just don't go there. So, checking that tendency towards anger is a good thing for everybody to do. There's plenty of scriptural support. I gave you a whole list of it that's not comprehensive. There's more. And if the Holy Word is authoritative to you, if it, it is your rule of faith and practice, you think it's important, then that should be enough. Just The Bible tells you not to do it, so don't do it. But there's better reason than even that. From what I've witnessed, anger, again, is one of those primary obstructions, if not the primary obstruction, to experiencing joy. God has said, hey, I've got joy for you. I promised you joy, that you would have joy, that your joy would be complete. I've made it possible. It's ready for you. The presence and the love of God, which are unshakable, that they, they don't go away, that makes joy a reality for the believer it's just that we let other things get in the way. Things like anger, they, we let them rule in our lives, and so we miss the joy. Anger, of the kind that we're warned about in scriptures, it's all self-centered. I don't like this. I'm offended by this. I'm upset with this. Things are not the way that I want them to be. You see the repeated word there? Who's running the show when we're angry? An over-focus on self. It's a surefire way for us to diminish in our awareness of God. I mean, it's just simple math. If we're looking at ourselves, we can't be focused on God. And it undermines our joy at the same time. But that's the negative side. That's the down, you know, getting rid of something. The, the, that, 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 getting rid of things that block joy, that's not the only thing that we can do. We can do something else. Being mindful of what we are called from, that's a good thing. But we should also be thinking about what we are called to. Now, Frederick Buchner, you've probably heard this quote. Um, he said once, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Buchner's talking about vocation, calling, what it is that you are supposed to be doing with your life. And Moshella, in her research on joy and pastoral counseling, she's observed this to be true. In my study of caregivers, she writes, whose stories express and evoke deep joy, a strong sense of vocation is one of the consistent themes. She continues, what stands out in their stories is not just a sense of calling to the ministry, she's working with pastors and counselors here, but a conviction that they are precisely where they belong, doing the exact work to which they were called. Grab a hold of that one. A conviction that they are precisely where they belong, doing the exact work to which they were called. Joy. Joy seems prevalent when people are doing what they feel like they should be doing, even if that work is full of difficulty, as it is often with pastoral counseling. Now, Michelle is working with professionals here, professional ministers, pastors, counselors. They've been called to that work both occupationally and, and vocationally. But I want to go a step further here. I want to I go deeper into this. This idea of calling, it's not just about profession. 
See, the greatest part of the New Testament discussion of vocation, calling, it has nothing to do with your job. I know that maybe is. Anybody that did, took VOTEC classes, you're like, well, yeah, it's about what you do, isn't it? It's about what you, your work, vocational training. That's what it's all about. Well, in the New Testament, it's not. It's not about what you do as a job. We think about it in those terms, that there's one perfect job for you. That's your vocation. That's your calling. You're going to do, pour your whole life into it as if a job could provide that degree of fulfillment. The scriptures, though, are talking about something else when they talk about calling, a different kind of calling, a different kind of vocation. In Ephesians 4, Paul has this wonderful text. And he's, he's referring to it. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling." Worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And he goes on a little bit later. He says, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. He's using that word again and again and again in a particular way. According to Paul, our calling, our vocation, is to be believers. That's it. Be a believer. Be a follower of Jesus. Be faithful. It's to make... Every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. This is our calling. This is our vocation. This is exactly the perspective that Paul is coming from when he writes this passage in Colossians, the one that we read at the beginning of the message today. He says, you people, Colossians, Nampa, you are called to this. You are God's chosen ones. God has selected you and brought you out of what you were into what you are intended to be. God has called you. And so here is your work. Here is your vocation. Clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience. Bear with one another. Put up with each other. <laughs> another way to say it. Bear with one another. Forgive each other. Above all, be covered with love. This is your calling. Be covered with love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. With all gratitude in your heart, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, whatever job you may have, whatever occupies your time, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is your calling. Giving thanks to God the Father through him. See, what Paul is describing here is what could be understood as the vocation of the Christian. It's got nothing to do with your occupation. All right? You could be a teacher, you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, you could be a, a farmer, you could be a mechanic. It doesn't matter. You could be a mom, a dad. Those are all wonderful things to do. But this is your vocation, your calling as a Christian as far as Paul is concerned. And it's got everything to do with your relationship with God. And when we're so tuned in to what God wants us to do, we recognize this calling in our, on our lives that, that, that we're, we're so enmeshed in it, we can't help but be aware of this holy presence and extravagant love. And here's the marvelous thing. When we're obedient in living out our vocation, that Christian vocation, then regardless of the difficulty we encounter, regardless of the circumstances that are difficult and painful, then joy is present. Joy is there. It, becomes, it comes because when we're living a life worthy of our calling, like he says in Ephesians, we're inevitably aware of that holy presence and that extravagant love because it is God who makes it possible to live that life. We can't do that on our own. We're not gonna. And this is what Michelle is talking about, that awareness. When we're doing what we're supposed to be doing as Christians, when we're living out this life that he describes in the Colossians passage, then joy manifests itself. Joy becomes part of our, part of our lived experience. And what is it again? What does Paul tell us that we're supposed to be doing? Being, uh, fulfilling some kind of occupation? No. This Colossians passage, that is a description of what it means to be Christian 
as called, called as a Christian. And we can, we can embrace that regardless of our occupation. So what we need to do is this. We need to live a life worthy of our calling. You ready to do that? You ready to commit to that? We need to live a life worthy of our calling. We need to do it for a number of reasons. One, again, it's what the Bible tells us to do. Now, we talked about this before in here, I know. If you consider the Bible to be authoritative and is your rule of faith and practice, you need to do what it says. Anybody have an issue with that? Nobody's raising your hand. The Bible says to do it, so let's do it. That should be enough, but we'll go on. Number two, living the way that Paul describes here in the Colossians passage, that is essential if we want this to be good, if we want this to be harmonious, if we want to be at peace in this community. We need to do this. Harmony, it's a natural outgrowth of the love that we are supposed to clothe ourselves with. Three, embracing that Christian calling, that vocation, that helps us. It, it, it increases our ability to be aware of the presence of God and his extravagant love. And four, finally, the natural joy that results when our deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger, that is a crowning jewel in our Christian witness. You want to talk about spreading the gospel. You want to talk about preaching the word. You want to talk about evangelizing the lost. This is how we do it. This is consistency on authenticity in our faith. It says, yes, we believe because you can see it in our lives that this is important to us. Lives of joy, people. Lives that are celebrations of the goodness of God. Not anger, not hostility, not argumentativeness, not the, the rage that seems to be marking many churches today. Not that stuff. It is joy that is a testimony to the goodness of God. Joy in tribulation, joy in trials, joy in difficulty, that is a sign that there's something more powerful than all this garbage that we have to deal with. That there's something that has overcome that and that the world cannot overcome. That is a source of joy. What we offer, folks, as Christians, as believers, what we offer is an alternative to all of the rage and the malice and the anger of the world. We offer the opportunity to be a part of a community of peace, of kindness, of compassion, of forgiveness, a place where we bear with one another. That is a community of joy. Michelle has another definition of joy. She says joy comes down to this, and I like this as well. It is being awake and deeply alive, aware of the love and the goodness of God, and mindful of the wondrous gift of life. Who couldn't be joyful if that was foremost in their mind? I think living worthy of your calling, living up to this Christian vocation is another way of saying the same thing. It's loving others, that's the fruit that comes of being loved of God. So, in conclusion of these last four weeks, God has made joy available and possible and a reality for all of us. And our response should be just to trust that that's true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you have been with us all along. You have not left us. You have not forsaken us. And you are a ever-present help in time of trouble. We go through our lives and then we know that they are laced with difficulty and at times it's hard for us to respond appropriately and for that we ask your forgiveness, Lord. We want to live lives that are full of joy and we know that if we are going to do that, we need to be aware of your presence. So open our eyes, open our hearts, and draw us closer to you every moment so that we might be a true witness the goodness that you have given us and the love that you have for us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. What better way to celebrate what God has done for us? What better way to be aware of that holy presence and extravagant love than to come to the communion table? 
the cup, the bread, they remind us of what God has done for us. They remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus was willing to offer freely. What more extravagant form of love can you imagine than Jesus being willing to die on the cross for our sake? We're going to do it the way we've been doing it for the past few uh, weeks. Uh, we're going to invite uh, the folks on the outside first and then the, the pews to just kind of come through and come up the center aisle. Take both a cup with a piece of bread and a cup with the, with the juice in it and just make your way back to your seats. If there's someone near you who may have a little bit of difficulty getting around, you can get two and, and take it for them. Just kind of be mindful of your neighbors um, and, and what they might need. And then uh, once we all have distributed everything and everybody's back in their place, then we'll, we'll follow this readings on the back of our, our order of service and, and then share in this time. So this is the logistical part. The worshipful part, we'll do that after we're all back in our seats. So I invite the folks on the sides to come forward.
for those that were not able to have some, join in spirit today, along with those folks at home who I think we're pretty doggone close to everybody getting one. If you need to maybe break your bread and share it across, that's fine, but we won't tell anybody that you did that. Uh, it's good to run out of communion elements. That means that we're gathering together. So if you would... It is our tradition here in the Church of the Brethren to invite all who have a relationship with Jesus Christ to the table. Um, all believers are, are invited in the name of the one who said, I am the bread of life. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not something that we control. It is a gift from God to us. It's here that we remember how he gave his body and his blood to save us. But because this is no ordinary meal... We should prepare our hearts and our minds for its significance and its power. I invite you to take a time of quiet reflection. If you want to bow your heads, if you want to pray, just prepare your hearts in whatever way that you feel is appropriate. I encourage you particularly to be thinking about your relationships with each other, your relationships with God as we come to this table. If you would bow with me. we have prepared our hearts it began in this way on the night that he was handed over our Lord Jesus Christ took bread and after giving thanks to God broke it and gave it to his disciples he said take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me let us pray together Thank you, Jesus, for loving us, even unto death. Send your Spirit upon us so that we may know that all who eat and drink at your table, in our congregation and around the world, are one body, one holy people. May we be inspired and equipped by this holy meal. The bread of life, Jesus' body, broken for you. You may take it together. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let us pray together. Lord, give us clean hearts, forgiving hearts, praising hearts. As we drink this, we join with our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth, giving thanks to you in an endless song of praise. May this cup remind us of your ever-flowing love. Amen. The blood of Christ was shed for you. You may take it together. This is a pretty nice family to be a part of, isn't it? Join me in this final prayer. We have come to your table, Lord, and in taking the bread and the cup, we have received a special gift. In remembering, we have come close to you, and we have tasted your infinite love. May your spirit transform us from within so that we can see with Jesus' eyes, hear with Jesus' ears, Speak with Jesus' mouth. Feel the world as Jesus feels to taste and see that the Lord is good. Lead us into the world, nourished by the bread of life. We pray in the name of the one who gave body and blood, 
Jesus Christ. Amen. Peggy? Let's stand and sing in closing, The Joy of the Lord is My Strength. again. Heavenly Father, it is your joy that is our strength. Carry us into the world full of joy, aware of your presence, bathing in your extravagant love. Help us to share that with everyone that we meet because that is our calling. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in joy and in peace. You're dismissed.